we're going to provide you with an introduction to the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute where we both work. Um, we'll then look at conflict as a research topic, the advantages of doing interdisciplinary research on conf conflict both from an individual and from an academic perspective in terms of how we col collaborate with colleagues, and then the challenges of interdisciplinary research on conflict. Then finally, we'll discuss about how to actually do interdisciplinary research on conflict, whether it's in the past or the present. And then we'll leave space for questions. Okay, um, so I'm also, um, because interdisciplinary is a word that gets difficult once you've said it more than about three times, um, I'm also going to talk about um, mixed methods or working across methods, but kind of under the same, the same rubric. So HCRI is a relatively new um, part of the university. It was set up a few years ago, I think in uh, 2008, and originally by people who were already working within the University of Manchester in different fields and, and sort of in different um, departments and in fact faculties of the university. Um, the HCRI swings between a couple of different priorities. So on the one hand, really focused on providing a sort of centre of excellence for research and also for postgraduate training. So on the academic side, a desire to really um, produce high quality research in a number of different um, disciplines related to um, humanitarianism and conflict response. And then on the other side, to participate in the sort of field issues, the, the current debates, and the, the policy making um, that is associated with that particular field. So in everything we do, there's a bit of attention to both sides of that, perhaps some more for others in one, one way or another, but those, those twin objectives are really running throughout um, HCRI in general. One of the issues, um, or one of the, the effects of that, we have a lot of partnerships, um, particularly with non-governmental organisations, but also with other research institutes that, that work in this field. And again, with this kind of aim to participate within debates, not um, to drive policy as such, but to shed light on it and to bring the academic research into that kind of policy and practice environment. And um, as, as we've mentioned, that means working across a number of dis different disciplines. Um, so it's particularly focused on medicine and, and applied medical disciplines um, and the humanities, um, but that includes a lot of different ways working within, within both of those fields. So nursing, um, but also political science, history and international relations, medical anthropology. Um, and we're really trying to work both in a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary way. So that means people bringing the, the kind of insights and their perspectives from their own disciplines to a collective conversation and also in an interdisciplinary way where those collaborations actually shape and influence the way you do your research and transform the work that you're doing. So there's, there's sort of two components um, to that, that, the conversation between the different disciplines in HCRI. Now these are the sort of the research themes um, that HCRI staff members um, work on. One of the issues with these kind of themes, um, not particular to our department, but across the university, is often these are a way of talking about what you don't do, as well as a way of talking about what you do do. Um, and they're designed to be inclusive, you know, to give staff members as much latitude as they want to build into their work. So these are not sort of hard and fast categories of research, but just ways of understanding um, some of the interests that we have. So I'll just talk you through um, a few of these, these key areas. Um, the first one that you can see in the, the top left there health and medicine in conflict, is to do with looking at, at health and medical issues in terms of the impact of conflict and other emergency settings upon them. So using that, that conflict and, and humanitarianism question as a, as a lens for looking at health and medical issues. Moving along, histories of humanitarianism um, does, does what you might think. Um, that's the sort of main strand that I, that I would be part of. But the key point there is thinking that these histories are um, studied in their own right, um, but also as part of a, a way of understanding what brought us to the way we look at things today. So connecting them up with current debates and thinking how a historical perspective can shed light on these debates as well. The strand of work on global resilience for health, disaster and humanitarian emergencies is really um, designed to capture this idea that we're working to improve responses. So more effective, um, more appropriate responses to particular emergency settings. Critical peace and conflict studies um, looks at issues like conflict resolution um, and peace building, peacekeeping and so on, but really trying to do that with a critical and analytical voice. Cultures of humanitarianism um, is particularly focused on understanding not just the technical side, which, which can be a real key feature of, of policy debates, but looking at, at how questions of representation, 
um, of communication actually transform the way we think about humanitarianism. So making sure that the cultural side of things is really part of, of our thinking. And then finally, the, the question on political violence, states and geopolitics, allows us to draw attention to some of the key actors within these settings and also how they connect to a kind of global environment. So as I mentioned, these are the sort of research strands nominally, but they also inform the teaching um, and supervision work that, that takes place within HCRI. And so within our institutes, probably of a department of about 20 academic staff, academic researching and research and teaching staff, L and I form uh, two out of probably four who are working on histories related to conflict and humanitarianism. So um, I want to have a bit of a little talk about how conflict is um, situated as a research topic. Um, and classically, it's seen as this image of war and violence, um, but it's much more of a complicated and complex topic than just, just that. It has a multifaceted nature of conflicts, and its ramifications are not just in terms of human um, <coughs> potential, but also in terms of social, economic, political, and cultural. Yet there are major disagreements in, within the um, acad academia about the causes of conflict and war and the, the correct responses to conflict and war. And no one, really, no one discourse seems to stand up to the main academic debate. Furthermore, to develop a response to conflict um, affected countries, it's been argued by some that interdisciplinary in coordination is necessary for efficient, comprehensive, and long-term planning of recovering conflict-affected societies. So therefore, in order to make sure we have a, an academic response to conflict and um, conflict-affected societies, we need to engage on an interdisciplinary basis. We need to engage with not just one particular academic field, but with many different academic fields. Um, it requires a broad spectrum of social science perspectives, along with the hard questions about research agendas, strategies, and ethics. Um, researching conflict involves questioning a great deal about ethical issues, and by combining different interdisciplinary re um, subject fields, we can hopefully try and overcome some of the ethical issues that, as an individual researcher, you might, you might come across. Um, discourse on conflict and violence in the global south, which is, tends to be what a lot of people in our research institute work on, presents a certain image of those affected which conform to Western discourse of international public bads, for example, according to Pottier et al. Thus, they present ethical dilemmas as for those who are researching um, conflict. We also have to decide when we're researching conflict, where does, when does conflict start, when does it end? Where does conflict exist? What are the conflict spaces in which violence exists? Is conflict just about violence? Is it also about disagreements on a more of a political scale? Um, and we have to think about how people, individuals, react to conflict in terms of their perspectives and their memories of conflict, how we think about it in the present compared to what, it ha what happened in the past. There's the widespread understanding that the topic of conflict needs to be understood from not just a security perspective, but also a development perspective, governance, um, therefore political, sociological, anthropology, anthropological perspective. Therefore, it's necessary for those of us who are wishing to engage with the conflict research that we engage with all, these, all those who are writing on this topic from those different disciplines. Um, and it can also have, just to finally point with this slide, it can also have a profound impact on the researcher. We talk about those who are being researched, but also researching conflict can have a profound impact on the researcher. And it's um, issues such as this that we also need to address. And this is where we can maybe apply an interdisciplinary approach to looking at researching conflict. So in terms of the advantages of taking an interdisciplinary um, approach to researching conflict, by looking at different disciplines, it offers a range of tools to shed light on the multifaceted object of the research. So it involves using methodologies that we're maybe, if 
from a sociology perspective, we're not always so comfortable with or not so familiar with. By engaging with an interdisciplinary approach, we can become aware of different methodological tools that are being used by others when researching conflict. Secondly, it encourages unexpected original research questions. So, for example, on my own research, um, in Uganda, I've been using a historical sociology perspective, but I'm also having to engage with the development literature, which, con which asks questions about the here and now and how are we going to improve poverty levels, for example, in Uganda. And this has prompted me to think about how I can interlink these two issues um, and for future research um, agendas when I'm looking at the case of conflict in Uganda. Um, it allows for an application of different theoretical insights. So we can therefore, by looking at other um, theoretical inputs from, from other disciplines, we can interrogate these, examine why they are useful, why they are not useful. So for example, the theory that I have been using in my research has predominantly been used in Western case studies. Um, and it has never been applied to an African case study and, and therefore I'm interrogating the usefulness of this theory whilst also investigating processes of state formation in Uganda. And hopefully I'll, I'll add not only to the discourse within development studies and humanitarianism and conflict but also add to the traditional sociology discourse which also just tends to look at a Western perspective of state formation. Um, <coughs> fourthly, Tensions between disciplines can actually force us to have conceptual creativity. So therefore, by presenting at conferences your research that you think is traditionally historical research, by presenting at conferences such as the European Development Studies Association Conference, which I did in the summer, you are then forced to answer questions from people who don't specifically think about historical research. Why is this important? And that, those, these sort of tensions can draw out further questions and create new avenues for research in the future. Um, obviously, doing interdisciplinary research can open up avenues for funding that may not be available to you traditionally in your own traditional um, academic field or discipline. And so therefore, it might involve collaborations with others to give you the opportunities to have better um, applications for um, further research funding. And it provides us with other research techniques which could have a less detrimental, detrimental effect on the researcher and participant. So, for example, as I just said, researching conflict can have um, a profound effect on the researcher by looking at other research methods and methodologies, how we can actually investigate conflict, maybe from an alternative perspective, we can therefore limit the impact that we have on the research and also on the researcher. So, for example, Northern Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army, I'm sure you've heard of Joseph Kony, features in part of my research. But because I am using a historical sociology approach, I'm therefore interrogating the data that's already there, rather than becoming another researcher in Northern Uganda from the West who's interrogating these people who have lived through the conflict. I'm using the data that's already there, that's already been cl collected by political scientists, anthropologists, other sociologists, using this data to form the data from my own research. Therefore, that limits the impact it has on the research and also the impact that it might have as a researcher on me going to a war-affected area. So... Moving on to think about some of the advantages in terms of the environment in which you're, you're doing this research, um, I've just got a few points to run through. I've written academic slash professional there because some of these are really to do with um, being within a university environment and engaging with other researchers um, within that community and some of these are to do with kind of reaching out beyond university whether that be um, in terms of policy engagement or other, other kind of audiences for research. Um, sometimes they're the same type of advantage and disadvantage, sometimes they're a little bit distinctive, um, but, but both feature here. Broadly speaking, I think we can think about these in terms of the sort of conceptual offerings that they bring, um, the practical side of things and the skills um, that, that you learn through this kind of work, um, and also some of the potential impacts for your, for your research in the long run as well. Um, so, so starting off, I think the first two points on the, on the slide there, they really come together. 
Um, so this idea that you, by, by talking to people who work on different methods and seeing how those methods interact with your own research, you really um, advance your own self-awareness. Um, so you learn a lot about, you know, what is my perspective? What is particular about what I'm doing? And what's maybe the same? You know, why is this person who's asking a set of different questions, using a set of different methods, coming up with some of the same ideas as me? So it's not only the contrast, um, but also the similarities that, that can help you think through your own work. Um, there is also the curiosity side of this. You know, it's healthy um, to explore things that are different from what you're used to or from what your immediate colleagues do. And sometimes we forget, you know, you get so focused on what's, you know, getting my job done and finishing my PhD or locking down this chapter that you think, actually, I need to just explore a little bit. And so interdisciplinary work or interdisciplinary environments can actually just be really enjoyable um, and, and quite fun. And that's something um, to keep in mind, which is maybe less, um, you know, of less interest to your supervisor, but is definitely an important part of, of doing this work. Um, in terms of this self-awareness, I think, um, just to, to speak a bit about my own experience, before I worked at this overseas development institute, a lot of the people I knew were working um, on history. You know, I was really, um, I'd, I'd had a, um, a, a few different majors in my degree. I'd worked in French studies. I also did um, literature, but I, I really spent most of my time talking to historians. And sometimes I felt a little bit like I was moving through different fields because I, I worked in French history, but I also knew people who did human rights history or he, people who worked on the history of ideas. Um, but everyone was thinking historically. And then when I arrived at ODI and I shared a thematic interest with people, um, but all of my colleagues were researching with different methods, it was really the first time I thought about what, what is different about thinking historically. Um, and for me, that was quite a, quite a discovery. For them as well, because basically um, this, the project that I worked on had been set up before I arrived. It was um, conceived of within the institute um, as a way of trying to bring back history into debates in the humanitarian sector that tend to be very ahistorical. So there's a real focus on what's happening now, what do we need to predict for the future, um, you know, kind of letting, letting go of lessons from the past or perspectives from the past and this onwards rush into every, everything new and original. Um, so they'd, they'd identified that as a problem, but hadn't really worked on the history themselves. And we spent a lot of time talking around in circles, trying to understand where the other side was coming from. And, and some of that was really not directly um, tied into any piece of work in particular, but just really great conversations where I started to think, okay, well, history does ask different questions here. And so um, actually getting the opportunity to explore that with others is a really important um, part of this, this whole process. Um, on the practical side, as just mentioned, you can, you can pull um, the sort of the data sets that you're using, the information that's coming out of the research. So that's one of the resources that, that we might talk about. The same applies to secondary resources. So not only the, the primary data that you're collecting or that others have collected, but other information that might help you in terms of background research, you know, context and so on. Working with others who've collected that information for different reasons um, can be really beneficial and provide you with a lot of shortcuts. And you can, um, in that sense, pool funds as well. So time and money can be um, doubled up in terms of the people who are getting the benefit from it. On the skills side, I think the, the ability to communicate your research to different people is one of the really great assets of working in an environment um, that uses a lot of different disciplines and, and methods. And there's a number of layers to this that I'll just um, run through really briefly. So first of all, being able to extract what's important, you know, being able to prioritise what's coming out of your own research, both in terms of the research questions and the research findings, is a really important thing. And this is one I think that definitely applies both to speaking to academics, working in other disciplines, and then to speaking to people outside of university. So really focusing in on, on what matters to you and why you think it matters um, is a skill that um, sometimes gets a little bit taken for granted when you're working, you're talking to others who have similar concerns and, and priority. A really important part of that is avoiding jargon. Um, so not just falling into using the technical terms that your colleagues or, or people who share your research interests are used to um, and, and not kind of giving way to that sort of intellectual laziness of, of using that shorthand as a way of, of cutting to the chase. So being precise about the terms and concepts that you're using because you can't assume that other people know about them is really great in terms of your communication face to face, but also again in the long run your writing skills. Um, and anyone who wants to publish for a range of different audiences will need to be able to do that. 
this is useful, as I mentioned, not just in terms of talking um, to academics, but in talking to other kind of potential audiences for your search. Um, so the, you know, the, the famous interested public that we all hope, hope to speak to would be one category, but perhaps um, if you're doing research that might be relevant to different media interviews, this could be of interest. Or otherwise forums, so say for historians, one of the obvious um, uh, other groups of people we might talk to are those who work in museums or other areas of where there's sort of public history going on. So being able to, again, communicate your findings or your interests to those kind of groups is really important. Um, the final point I want to make about this is this is not a kind of end of project type of, of, um, of interest or, or of concern. So although disseminating findings is one of the key areas where being able to talk about your research in an accessible manner is really important, it can actually feed into the research process as well. So if you're reaching out to a partner organisation that you want to collaborate with and you're able to talk to them without jargon, then that can be really important in terms of helping you get access to those people or say in interviewing skills, being able to say why you're interested in something, being able to explain those interests to others can actually feed back into the research as it's ongoing. The final point that I wanted to make here is to do with the policy engagement side of things. So without, without going into detail, um, it's a kind of obvious point, but people who are making decisions don't use one set of information to make those decisions and they can't afford to look only with, with one lens. So this kind of engagement, this kind of concern isn't really about mastering all of the potential um, perspectives on a particular issue, but being able to kind of be conversant in those issues, being aware of what's coming out of, of other disciplines, and also being able to indicate your contribution within them is a really um, useful asset in this kind of environment. So I want to move on and talk a bit about, about the challenges of interdisciplinary research. And some of these are focused just on, on um, interdisciplinary in work in general, but also some of them are more focused on interdisciplinary work on, re on conflict specifically. And um, firstly, as an individual researcher, interdisciplinary research can be intellectually demanding. And this means it requires a development of additional skills and willingness to embrace perhaps even more than what you may be doing from a single di discipline, willingness to embrace the confusion that other methodologies may present to you. So this involves taking the time out to go to different departments, to go to different uh, research seminars, to go to different conferences in order to engage with the methodological tools. And that's something that in the time limits of a three-year PhD, that not necessarily everyone has the time to do. And it's, that's where it involves you having been really completely organised. And that's where we move on to the next um, point in terms of resource heavy on multiple levels. And the first point would be on time. Um, for me, I'm taking a historical sociology approach. So I use secondary sources predominantly as my da data. However, sometimes it is necessary to interrogate the archives. So, for example, I have had to go to the archives in Kampala in Uganda in order to make sure that the data that's coming up in the secondary sources is correct because there might be a bit of um, confusion between two different sources. And that takes time. That might not just involve one fieldwork research trip that my colleagues would do if they're just collecting primary data. That has involved me going to Uganda every single year of the PhD in order to go and visit these archives or visit inter interview specific people that I needed to do and that I only realised after I had written certain parts of my analysis. It's also um, resource heavy in terms of money. Um, if you're a self-funded student be trying to arrange to go to different places such as um, archives in the UK or abroad or go to different conferences can have an impact on your funding but also this can impact you if you are a funded student because you might only get one opportunity to go to a fieldwork site or only two. So that's something to take, take into account. I also say resource heavy as well in terms of brain power I suppose how, how are you actually going to encompass all these different methodologies, all these different theoretical um, inputs, and try and make them into something that you want to use for your own research? And this is where it involves close collaboration, not only with your supervisors, but also those who are working on these theories in other disciplines. Um, secondly, it's trying to... Thirdly, sorry. It's trying to find that balance between getting the... Um, 
ensuring that you are doing the PhD for your discipline that you have signed up to do, but also getting an interdisciplinary PhD. So, for example, my PhD is in development policy and management, and yet I'm doing a historical <coughs> PhD on um, development policy, on development, sorry. So it's trying to ensure that I still meet that criteria of my department and making sure that I am going to be having an impact on futures of development, whilst also making sure that my PhD is on my intended subject, which is interrogating development as a long-term process of social change. Um, also, in terms of a researcher, it's sometimes hard when you're combining disciplines to work out what exactly is original about your contribution. Using multiple fields can make it hard to identify what exactly you're saying that you, is new. So, for example, one of my key outputs is that I believe that the research methodology I'm using can tell us something about how the Ugandan state was formed. And yet, there are parallels with the political science literature, which I know I have been questioned about in um, conferences and said, well, what, does, what difference does it exactly have? But what I'm trying to say is that we can use <coughs> theories that have traditionally been seen as Western theories on non-Western case studies. And I'm trying to dissolve that distinction between them and us that exists within development discourse and um, especially when we're looking at how conflict impacts the development of states. So, for example, a lot of the historical sociology literature is talking about um, the impact of war and how war had a huge um, impact on the formation of Western states. War was the key for the formation of Western states, whereas war has an opposite effect when we look at developing country states. And yet that's a quite superficial way of looking at it. Using the methodology I've used, I've been able to... I've been able to interrogate other infrastructures of military power that have shown me that sometimes war doesn't always have a detrimental effect on state formation in these areas. And finally, um, it's sometimes hard to challenge the assumptions that underpin our disciplines. So, for example, I'm, as I've said, I'm the only one in my the development studies department who works on history, whereas within the Humanitarian Conflict Response Institute, I am one of four who are working on history. Um, and even though development studies is seen as interdisciplinary, I still get questioned as, why exactly are you working on history? What does it impact today's development? What, how can, what can we tell DFID to do? Um, and it goes back to the story of there's this distinction between disciplines. History and sociology are seen as very distinct disciplines. And actually, if we go back to the history of history and sociology, we'll see that in the past, they were one discipline that worked quite distinctly together until one person decided to, that history should be interrogating individual events. So we've got to try and overcome these assumptions or traditional views that may exist within our disciplines even disciplines that declare that they are interdisciplinary. Uh, so think, thinking about some of these challenges um, within the actual the work environment, um, again, some of these will pick up the themes that, that Jess has already talk about, talked about. Um, one of the issues is the relevance question. So why should I bother? Why should I read or listen to you talk about what you're doing when it seems so different from mine, both in terms of um, the area of your research interests, the way you're going about things, the nature of your findings, and having to overcome that, that kind of scepticism can be, can be really tiring and also a bit of a challenge in terms of your own self-esteem. Um, and Jess has already mentioned this sort of issue of the, the, the relevance of history within these kind of um, development humanitarian policy um, discussions, and that was a, a huge issue in the, the project. Um, that I was working on, partly because if, if people are used to working in some more political science methods, um, they, they tend to have theories that they like to work with, and the kinds of history that I do in particular is often much more empirical, so detailed analysis of, of a particular case, um, and being able to, to draw out the connections, you know, what, how do you actually find links between these two, 
um, was, was really difficult. So why should I read about this flood in the 1920s when I'm actually working on kind of floods in Pakistan in, in 2008? You know, it's sort of, we, how do you actually make these links for people when you might not be an expert on, on what they're talking about either? Um, just to one slightly flippant example, I did also have a, um, a conversation at the organization I worked in. We were funded by organizations like the Department for International Development, although actually not um, DFID itself, funnily enough. But um, we did have a conversation with a funder who we were explaining our project to them. We said we're working on history and, and we think it's really important there's very little historical engagement within the humanitarian sector, and in particular, there's very little historical engagement with anything outside of the Western narrative. So if people do look at history, they look at the Red Cross, they look at Oxfam, they look at the familiar organizations, and what we want to do is look at you know, what was going on in other parts of the world. What other ideas were people using? What other techniques did, did they develop? Um, and and the, the person on the other end of the phone said, well, why, why would we fund this kind of research? We already know they're important now. Let's focus on building our partnerships and move forward. And it was almost a kind of a, a blanket refusal at that time, which is a really difficult thing um, to overcome in terms of your own work. Moving on slightly, um, even if people are interested, you can spend an awful lot of time just bringing them up to speed with the basics. Um, so if the material isn't familiar to them or the methods aren't familiar, familiar to them, what you end up doing is teaching them the kind of the landscape in which you're doing your research, the context and, and some of the skills, but not actually talking as much as you might like about your findings. Um, so that can be another, another issue even when people are kind of willing to get on board with, with what you're hoping to discuss with them. Another key area, and I think this is um, particularly important when, you, when you're starting out your research or you know, it's sort of early days, um, is this, this idea that you're vulnerable to, to being called superficial. Um, and, and, you know, we all, we all have that fear of, of getting up to present at a conference and someone says, oh, well, you referenced this idea, but you didn't talk about X expert in that field or your engagement with this concept seems to be a little bit light. Um, and so you, you feel a little bit vulnerable to that sort of, that sort of critique. Um, there's not much you can do about that, I think, in some ways. Just have to accept that that's, that's, part, of, that's part of life in this kind of field. Cherry picking of, of ideas has a really bad name, but on the other hand, we can't actually be experts in every single relevant discipline. Um, and if that was the expectation, no one would, would ever do anything creative. Um, and I think that's something that's really important to remind yourself, um, as well as be willing to, to defend from others, because in some cases, we're our own worst enemies. And through fear of being unable to, to discover the whole, um, uh, say, you know, I'm not going to become an architect just because I'm interested in, in the dynamics of space and how they affect social interactions. And so, I, you know, not kind of limiting yourself because you can't do everything is a really important um, part of this, but, but it is a real challenge. Um, in terms of the sort of um, the social environments and what you might think of as your kind of academic home, I think the, these last two things come together. They're sort of different sides of the same coin in a way. So on the one hand, you have lots of avenues for outreach, lots of people to have conversations with, many conferences you might attend, reading groups to be part of, lots and lots of interconnections, and that can be a really exciting thing, but a less obvious home. And it is a really important source of support to have colleagues that do share your concerns. Um, and so not feeling quite so much like you belong in one particular little group that have really, really close interests um, can be a little frustrating. On the same side, you have these issues of, of where to place your research and how to get kind of institutional financial support for it. So it can be that um, publication channels and funding channels are a little bit less tailored to the kind of work you do because a lot of them have, have, were developed when these sort of more traditional disciplines were actually um, the, the way most people went about things. Um, I, I do think this is improving, actually, that you know, there are a lot of new journals, there are a lot of um, funding schemes that are designed to promote this kind of creative work, um, but still a bit of a, a lag. So a lot of, um, you know, a lot of funding schemes will ask you to, to be interdisciplinary, but then you might kind of get feedback that suggests actually we didn't really know what your priority was. And so that, that, that can be a really um, a, a difficult challenge as you keep moving through and one that, that pops up you know, in different phases of your career as well. So how do you make it happen? How do you pro provide an interdisciplinary approach to researching conflict, whether you're researching it in the present or the past? And how do you provide an interdisciplinary approach in general? Um, and I suppose it's engaging beyond your comfort zone. 
or your priority areas. So it's not just engaging with the research groups, the reading groups, the conferences, the workshops that your department or discipline is offering you, but it's also going and engaging with other areas. So, and this involves looking back at what you have studied in the past, for example, and you may find that in the, your past work or your past degrees, for example, that you actually were engaging with multiple disciplines. So for myself, I did a master's in international development, but my undergraduate degree was in European studies, and I did a minor, equivalent of minor in German history. So when I started to look at state formation and conflict specifically, my, my work on German history provided quite a good idea for looking at different ways of different methods of looking into this, this area. And although not, any of, not many of them were actually useful for looking at Uganda, it helped me reflect on the processes that I took when taking a historical approach to conflict. And therefore I could go back, look at these theories, see how useful they were, and it led me onto the actual theoretical framework that I've eventually used in my research. It involves um, sampling methods that you may want to develop. And obviously this involves time, this involves writing, but it, it might involve in your research period, whether that is practical, empirical, going out into the field, trying out some of the different research methods. And you may find that they don't work for you. They don't provide the data that you want to, want to see, or they provide information that isn't exactly relevant. Store this up. This may be useful for a paper or a conference in the future. Or it may be useful in terms of interrogating the research methods and supplying that information to others who are working on the field of conflict, saying that in this setting, this research method wasn't particularly useful. It comes from this discipline. However, it could be useful for researching maybe peacekeeping processes, for example. Um, it also involves considering different forms and sources of assistance. So for me, from a development studies department, I found it really useful to go to the Humanitarian Conflict Response Institute, attend the seminars that were taking place, attend the reading groups and the workshops that they had, because all of a sudden I found people I could talk with, people who understood the trials, tribulations of researching history, researching conflict from a historical perspective, which nobody in my department really could understand. Um, and then that also involves other departments within the university, but also engaging with other universities within the area and attending conferences that maybe you wouldn't normally maybe attend or wouldn't normally, maybe that your supervisors wouldn't normally recommend. Um, and making sure that you make use of online resources or um, other information that institutions that maybe you don't have direct access to those working in other countries making use of the publications that they are producing just to test and feel out whether these methods are useful for your actual research. So I've just said being reactive and reflective, so obviously looking at the different disciplines that you have actually been exposed to, but also to what your colleagues have been exposed to. Depending upon your department, it may be seen as quite an interdisciplinary department, and you might have colleagues who have worked in other disciplines in the past. Talking to them about research methods, going over what they have done in the past, and how that might work in your research setting. Um, identifying gaps rather than trying to be exhaustive. I'll just pass that over to you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I touched on that um, before, but not thinking that in order, you know, the first step isn't necessarily to go out and get borrow the collected edition of Michel Foucault, it's thinking, okay, what do I need? You know, what, what is my current methodology giving me and where is it a little weak or where, where are gaps coming through that I could fill uh, or supplement, enrich by using other, other methods? And I think this comes back also to the kinds of resources um, that you might use to do that. So, again, thinking I don't need to be exhaustive on everything. I might start by just listening to a recorded lecture and seeing, okay, am I interested in pursuing this further? And then working from there rather than leaping straight in and thinking I've got to use my standard research methods every time I want to engage with a new discipline. And that involves what every time that you get feedback from your supervisors is interrogating the feedback that you received in the past whether they've mentioned new research methods, whether this is um, whether it's important that I actually take stock, especially if you're in the second or third year coming back, take stock of what's happened, 
what um, feedback I received in the first year, go back to this information and then see how useful it is and maybe helping you to understand that your research could be interpreted in a different way.